Well, Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump has formally accepted his nomination, calling for unity in his first speech since he survived an assassination attempt. He shared his personal account of the shooting, saying he was saved by the grace of God. Uh, this was in his keynote speech on the final night of the Republican National Convention. He also talked about his campaign goals, but didn't give many details on how he would achieve them. Celebrating Donald Trump. After officially accepting the nomination as the Republican presidential candidate, he tried to sell a message of unity. I'm here tonight to lay out a vision for the whole nation, to every citizen, whether you're a young or old man or woman, Democrat, Republican or independent, black or white, Asian or Hispanic, I extend to you a hand of loyalty and of friendship. Together, we will lead America to new heights of greatness like the world has never seen before. A message that went down well with his followers. He wants to unite all Americans, not just for Republicans, but Democrats, Republicans, independents, like he said, all of America. He's looking out for his people, and that's different than the administration that we're having now. It gives us a lot of hope, and I can't wait to make America great again. I think he's changed the entire temperature, and he's trying to create unity within our country. That was a very unifying message. I think that it covered all of the platform and the party, but also what he wanted to accomplish in the next four years, as well as kind of carry over from his last four years. The convention was also the first major test for Trump's pick for Vice President J.D. Vance. The attendees are confident that the Trump-Vance ticket will win in November. The GOP now has its candidates and portrays itself as a unified party. As the Republican National Convention in Milwaukee comes to a close, the attention is now shifting back to Washington, where President Biden is facing increased pressure from within party ranks to step aside in the race for the White House. Well, Brandon Bourne is a political analyst at the Bertelsmann Foundation's Europe programme. Welcome to DW. Uh, what did you make of Donald Trump's uh, vision for the United States? I think he showed his true colours. I mean, the, uh, as was said, this speech was branded as one that would focus on unity, it would focus on calming the waters after what was a very turbulent week in the United States. And for the first 15 minutes or so, that was the case. You know, there was the, the line that you just heard in the report, but the line about, you know, I'm, I'm my candidacy is for all Americans, not half of Americans. Now, having said that, when that 15 minutes on the teleprompter ended, what followed for the next two and a half hours, I think, really showed uh, who Trump is as a candidate. Um, for example, he said also at the very beginning, we shouldn't demonize each other for political differences, but then goes on to say that Biden is worse than the worst 10 presidents of, of all time put together. Crazy Nancy Pelosi and the Democrats are ruining our country. I mean, that's that's not unifying language. So I'm a little bit surprised by the by the interviews that were just shown on the screen. And, you know, if you're an independent voter who's kind of on the fence about whether to vote for Donald Trump, I can't imagine that this three hour speech tonight would really sway you in, in his direction. Lots of people at the convention have been talking about God sparing Donald Trump from the assassin's bullet, and Trump himself posted that it was God alone who prevented what he called the unthinkable from happening. Is this just hyperbole, or is this sort of religious messaging targeting a particular voting constituency? Well, I, I don't want to speak to his individual faith, but I do believe that Christian conservative nationalism is something that is really taking the Republican Party by storm, especially some of its younger members who represent the next generation of the America First movement. J.D. Vance, for example, spoke um, spoke on this on this note a, a lot during his speech uh, just yesterday evening. So there's uh, I, I I do believe that that's something that's happening to the Republican Party. But what I can say is that. You know, the truth was bended at every uh, turn during this during this speech. I watched it live myself. There were fact checkers watching it um, live as well that 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 pointed out falsehoods at, at, at various points. I think the points that he made at the very beginning that were then contradicted over the course of his longer speech just speak to the that uh, that speaks to the authenticity of the candidate. Turning to the Democrats then, President Biden has COVID and the calls for him to go are increasing. The Trump campaign appears to have been boosted by uh, the weekend shooting. How do Democrats come back from this? 
Well, what the Republicans showed over the last few days is they showed unity. They showed an energy in their party. They showed a common vision. And that's exactly the opposite of the Democratic Party at the moment. I mean, I, Joe Biden is isolated not only from his COVID <clears throat> diagnosis, he's also isolated from within his own party. I'm not sure there's been a lower point besides maybe the evening of the debate performance uh, a few weeks ago. So the Democratic Party is in a very difficult position. Of course, there have been reports within the last 10 hours that suggest Biden could be opening to dropping out of the race. But a lot of this messaging is contradictory at the moment. You have senior advisors that are saying he's in it for he's in it to win it. He's our candidate. And others that are saying it's not a matter of if um, it's not a matter of if Donald, uh, Joe Biden drops out of the race, but a matter of when. So, I mean, these are the types of things. But I do think that um, if Joe Biden is going to stay in the race, the efforts of the last couple of weeks to to right the wrongs of, of, of the debate performance have not been particularly effective. Right. This strategy of it, that's been quite defensive of saying, you know, the polls are not correct and people are not telling me I can't win. One, that's not true. And two, I don't believe that that's a winning strategy. It has to be, it has to show a common uh, future oriented vision of the United States. That's a winning argument. Let's speculate then on what a Trump victory might mean domestically and internationally. We'll start with immigration. How would that change under a Trump to White House? Well, immigration featured prominently. I think besides the economy, it was one of the one of the main focuses of the event uh, of the event this evening, the speech. I think I heard the word invasion used around 35 to 40 times. The way in which the immigration debate was framed this evening was anything was was vitriolic as it has been in the past, going all the way back to Trump's comments about immigrants in 2015 when he first announced his candidacy at that time. So, you know, and you also see, for example, posters in the audience that are talking about mass deportations. I believe Trump also mentioned that the United States would carry out the largest deportation effort in American history as well. I think if you look at the plans that are included, for example, in Project 2025 from the Heritage Foundation, if uh, Donald Trump and his circle is, uh, if they're successful in changing institutions, changing the executive institutions uh, moving forward, and of course you have a you know a conservative Supreme Court that would right. uh, potentially assist in this regard, um, we, we could see some of these major uh, major policies actually implemented. Okay. I just want to squeeze in this last one. Uh, uh, Trump argues that putting America first would boost the, uh, the, the US economy, increase jobs, incomes and national security, and also encourage Europeans to take responsibility for their own defence. Do you see a downside of this inward-looking? Do you see a downside for the US? I do see a downside for the US. I mean, America first, what does that mean? It's it's nationalism, it's isolationism, it's protectionism, it's it's nativism, it's I mean when you when you think about these terms and you think about times in history when these things came together, typically we we had bad things follow. So no, I, I think it's an oversimplified view of a of an increasingly globalized world. America first would severely hinder the United States from being able to deter foreign threats. From building alliances, uh, from uh, from trade, from entering trade negotiations, America first—a winner-takes-all approach to trade that ultimately would benefit the American economy—that just does not work. And when it comes to European security and defense, this is a, a very touchy subject. As you know, I mean, we could see a complete reversal, for example, in U.S.-Ukraine policy come January of next year, based on both Trump and Vance's comments. And uh, but but this would essentially require Europe to 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 step in. And right. I will say a, a, deci a decision within the last uh, couple of days here, Germany uh, reducing its uh, military budget to Ukraine next year. That's that's not moving in the right direction. Thanks for guiding us through that so clearly. Political analyst of Brandon Bourne from the Bertelsmann Foundation. Thank you. Take care. Let's get more from DW reporter Michelle Stockman, who joins me now live on the line. Michelle, it was the speech we've all been waiting for. We've talked about it so much. Did it live up to the hype? Brush, Trump started out sounding like an angel, talking about an assassination attempt that really seemed to have been a religious experience for him, that he was able to dodge it. Um, and he also gave a unifying message that Americans should overcome the political divide and that he was running for president for the whole country, not just half the country. 
but his speech quickly morphed into that of the tone of a vengeful American demigod, I would say, who is uh, railing against injustice, who is looking to settle scores, and is talking about uh, ultimatums to achieve that rather than uh, really spelling out his policy or diplomacy that could meet those ends. However, I would say that as a whole, the Republican convention was a success in terms of resetting the Republican Party away from this image of chaos that surrounded his campaign in 2020. It was a smooth operation, one that looks ready to kind of take office and lead if he's elected. And uh, his speech was also successful in terms of contra contrasting his image against mm -hmm. that of Biden. He came across as a wounded warrior who's still uh, vigorous and ready to lead, uh, whereas uh, Biden is having uh, definitely some mishaps with his public image. Trump was also laying out his plans for a second presidency. Did we hear anything new in those plans? We heard not really anything new, more of the greatest hits. He talked about how he's going to crack down on illegal immigration, which will reduce, uh, in his words, crime and also make more jobs available to Americans. He strangely brought up uh, Hannibal Lecter, the fictional serial killer, uh, making the case that America is unsafe because uh, serial killers are coming over as illegal immigrants. Very strange, greatest hit of his. Um, he also talked about how he wants to drill baby drill, increase uh, energy production in America to reduce gas prices. That might not necessarily work because there's a lot of factors that affect gas prices. Um, and then he also, uh, foreign policy-wise, uh, talked about how he will end the war in Ukraine. He talked about how he will end the war in Gaza. And he also talked about American hostages, I assume, uh, in Gaza held by Hamas, that Hamas, if they don't release them by the time he gets in office, that uh, they will pay a big price. A lot has been said, uh, Michelle, about Trump spreading false and misleading information. How factual was this speech? Let's just touch on a few things that stuck out to me. I made a little list here. Uh, some of the big whoppers, he said, were first that um, illegal immigrants, there's an invasion of illegal immigrants that are coming across and killing a hundred, more than 100,000 Americans a year. Not sure where he's getting those numbers. He said COVID uh, was the way that the... Uh, that fraud was uh, committed in the 2020 election, although there's been overwhelming evidence that this election was not marred by fraud. Uh, and the other thing that stuck out to me was he said that under his administration, the unemployment rate had been the lowest in history. That's not true. Uh, unemployment was actually lower for a couple of months under Biden's administration. And uh, while Trump was uh, in the limelight in Milwaukee, what was President Joe Biden doing? I'm going to warn you here, Baresh, I'm going to get a little poetic, so don't get scared. Go on, Michelle. Uh, you know, when I look at the uh, Biden, okay, when I look at the Biden uh, campaign right now, I'm reminded of some verses from Dylan Thomas. Do not go gentle into that good night, rage, rage against the dying of the light. Joe Biden has been sidelined by COVID and is weighing a huge decision whether he should give up his pres whether he should withdraw from the race for president. And this is a huge decision for him. This is a man who is used to overcoming the odds, who is a comeback kid himself. Uh, this will really define his place in history if he withdraws from the race. And he has said only almighty God could convince him to withdraw from the race. Uh, then he changed that a little bit a few days later. Uh, and he said, if a doctor says that he's not medically fit, then perhaps he would withdraw from the race. And all this came after he had uh, kind of a disastrous uh, debate performance against Trump a few weeks ago. However, the voice that may convince him may come from Nancy Pelosi. There are reports that she has had conversations with him, showing him polling from key swing states that he needs to win and Trump is leading. And it may be that he may not be able to overcome that lead and Democrats are looking to switch horses in the middle of the race. So he's under an immense amount of pressure. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a man who kept on running because he is convinced that he can beat Trump. However, we'll have to see what decision he makes. It's, uh, it's anybody's guess at this moment. We'll leave it there for the moment. Thanks so much for joining us today. DW reporter Michelle Stockman. Let's get more now from Leslie Vinjamuri. She's a director of the U.S. and the Americas program at the Chatham House think tank in uh, London. Good morning, Leslie. Trump says he's a 
changed man after the failed assassination attempt. Did you see a new Trump in his speech? I think the first part of the speech really did try to uh, speak to a unity agenda. He recounted the assassination attempt um, and, and he appeared to reach out. And certainly in the days before the convention, he made a few moves in this direction, inviting Nikki Haley, his opponent, for that nomination. But then in what was a very long speech, he quickly turned to a very divisive agenda that was littered with fake facts um, that only by name referenced President Biden once, calling him the worst history, uh, the worst president in the history of the United States. If you added up the 10 worst presidents, um, Biden would be even worse than that. But throughout the speech, um, he really, uh, he really was very derogatory towards the past administration. And he returned to that agenda that we've heard so much from the former president talking mm -hmm. about uh, the worst invasion in the history of the United States, people invading the country from Africa, Asia, the Middle East, um, Latin America. Uh, and and I think perhaps most disturbing for many Europeans, um, really rejecting the climate change agenda, uh, talking about drilling more oil um, and ensuring that others were dependent on the United States for this um, and so I think really what would be a very dramatic turn across many items of foreign policy and, and taking on America's allies, saying that they take advantage of the United States. So much of that MAGA agenda that we heard for those four years uh, during President Trump's first administration, mm -hmm. right back central to his central to his speech. Let's talk about immigration because he brought it up. I think he was talking about a, a so-called invasion uh, of the country and he also promised the largest deportation of illegal immigrants in uh, US history. Does this sort of indicate that immigration is front and center, the major uh, deciding issue for this election? I think that um, the top issue for most Americans is our prices. What are they paying for gas? What are they paying for food? Um, in other words, inflation. And certainly President Trump in his speech um, talked about how bad inflation was. He he certainly was inaccurate with the truth on this dimension. And in June, it was around 3%. He called it the worst inflation uh, in the history of the United States. It's simply not true. Um, but immigration is right up there in that top bucket of issues that the United States that Americans are concerned about. And Democrats and Republicans are concerned about immigration. And we've seen President Biden try to take some positive measures uh, for border control. Some of those were in, uh, were obstructed by a Republican Congress uh, that was um, you know, told by Donald Trump not to pass an agenda. So that's been a real struggle. It's been deeply political. Um, it is a genuine concern, but it is an inflated concern by, by former President Donald Trump in his speech. So, um, but yes, this will be, this is a something that strikes fear in ordinary Americans. They, mm -hmm. uh, they worry about crime associated with immigrants. They worry about immigrants um, taking their jobs. A lot of that is not grounded in, you know, facts, but it is a fear that is very easy to mobilize. And, and Donald Trump is certainly doing that. We were talking to Ines Paul, our correspondent reporting from the RNC in Milwaukee, and she said that it was surprising how foreign policy uh, is also making, is, is also important in this election cycle, unlike other previous election cycles. And Donald Trump was also talking about ending the wars in Ukraine and Gaza. Did we hear any details on how he plans to do that and what one can expect? There isn't in the speech um, a detailed plan for what he intends to do. You're right that he painted a picture of the world that was dangerous um, and, and with multiple wars. He talked about Iran having money that it should never have had, building towards uh, nuclear weapons and, uh, and blaming all of this on, on President Biden, saying that uh, Israel never would have been attacked um, by Hamas had he been president. Uh, and we know that there are, you know, some ideas that President Trump, when he was in office, had a plan for the Middle East. It was a, largely about normalization, um, the Abraham Accords, and then pushing forward with normalization between Saudi and Israel. And we also know that uh, that plan for normalization ignored the Palestinians and that that has come back to um, come back 
at the, the world for not really dealing with the, the question of Palestine and a Palestinian state. So there isn't a clear plan. I do think that were President Trump to be elected, mm-hmm. that this would be an area of the world that he would focus on. This is a president who likes to do deals and who, and who would love nothing more than to win the Nobel Peace Prize in the Middle East is certainly um, ripe for peace uh, efforts, whether there's actually a detailed, measured, pragmatic, implementable plan, that is very far from obvious. And after listening to that speech, Leslie, what do you think the Democrats have to do? I think that, um, as we know, um, the pressure on President Biden to uh, announce that he won't um, run again is great. It's coming from the most senior leadership across the Democratic Party. There are signs that he um, may indeed announce that he won't run again. We'll have to wait and see on this. Mm -hmm. Um, The Democratic Party needs to be unified. Uh, Whoever is going to be the candidate, um, that person, whether it's Kamala Harris or somebody else, um, needs to make a very strong stand. They need to get behind her. There needs to be a running mate. Um, And the the American public, if they're going to be able to consider a new candidate in the Democratic Party, need to hear about this soon and have confidence Mm -hmm. that that person can deliver. This is a uh, it is still several months out from an election. But in the U.S. context, this is a very rapid um, uh, change that will feel um, destabilizing to many people. But that problem can be overcome. And the the opponent, Donald Trump, is, again, somebody who's wildly popular with his base, but not very popular with many Americans um, mm-hmm. that are looking for an alternative. So this is really something for the Democrats to to consider. We'll leave it there for the moment, but pleasure talking to you. Leslie winjer from the Chatham House Think Tank in London. Thanks so much. Thank you. And for the reaction here in Germany, let's bring in our political correspondent, Emily Gordine. Emily, good morning. Did Trump say anything that would make Germany's leaders sit up and take notice? Not really, Biresh. Ultimately, Trump at some point said that he would end all international crises, which is very much in line with what he has said previously, that he would end the war in Ukraine within 24 hours. Um, Now, there is a lot of scepticism over whether this is even possible. Um, Of course, European leaders want to see an end to the war in Ukraine. Um, But the question is, of course, at what costs? And um, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky himself has said that such a swift deal um, would come at enormous costs for Ukraine and that, that he himself would not agree to such an arrangement. Now, the rest of Trump's speech very much focused on domestic issues, on the presidential race, on his political opponents. Um, And that is very much in line with what is expected here in in Germany, namely that the US under Trump will focus more on itself, on its own interests, and that there will be an even more visible pivot to China, um, leaving the Europeans very much um, to fend for themselves. Now, that's not necessarily going to be very much dif- very different from um, a potential Biden or Dem- a Democrat uh, presidency, but it's the tone that makes the difference. And there is an expectancy here that the tone will be harsher, the wind will be rougher, and it will be more aggressive under a Trump administration. And that comes with a lot of challenges for Europe, um, not least in terms of its military and security aspect here. Um, you know, the US is, um, foots, foots a, a large part of the bill when it comes to NATO, and it is very much Um, the security guarantor for much of Europe. And that means that um, when the US then, you know, under Trump, will want to see a more engaged Europe, and Europe is already preparing for that. Germany is investing more in its military. Mm -hmm. And um, essentially... Um, this, but the, the question is just how fast this will be, this will have to be, this change. And um, that will be ultimately the challenge for Germany to become less reliant on the United States here under a Trump administration. We'll leave it there for the moment. Thanks so much for joining us today. DW political correspondent Emily Gordine.